It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, welcome back, everyone. Episode number 46, season two. A uh, big shout out to all the new followers on our Facebook group. If you have not joined yet, it's a great community of like-minded people. Be sure to check it out beneath the helmet on Facebook. It's a community group full of first responders from across the world, uh, sharing their stories, their experiences, their nuggets, their wisdom, and a place to uh, learn and grow as well. So I hope you can join us there. Also see down below a, a link to join our newsletter, uh, beneath the helmet newsletter. Love to have you on our, on our list and in our community. So we can make sure that you get the most current up-to-date information from beneath the helmet. So all those links will be down below. Be sure to check them out. So today I got a chance to sit down with a, a new friend of mine, a fellow author, a fellow podcaster, a firefighter in Norfolk, USA, and recently promoted. I get to sit down today with Josh Chase. So Josh is a very passionate individual who's had lots of life experience uh, from his days uh, fighting in Iraq to now being a firefighter. Uh, he's got a life full of, uh, you know, challenging times, a lot of pain, uh, but the way that he's kind of grown from his pain uh, is truly inspirational. So be sure to check out this episode uh, with Josh Chase. So Josh is not just uh, an author of one book, Jump Seat Leadership. He's not just the author of two books, Front Seat Leadership, but his latest one, Engage the Enemy. Uh, all three very quick, easy reads, uh, all around leadership and, and kind of his story and his wisdom and nuggets that he gathered through his, his careers. And like I said, he's had lots of challenging times. Most of this podcast is focused around one incident in his life that really kind of changed the trajectory of his life and was really a, a time for resilience building and some real personal growth. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode. Uh, this is with Josh Chase, episode number 46. Until next time, stay well. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Another amazing episode of Beneath the Helmet. Today, I got a... Uh, a new friend of mine that I've connected with in the U.S., a fellow podcaster, writer, advocate for the fire service. Today, we got a chance to have a great conversation with Josh Chase, lieutenant at Norfolk Fire Service. Yeah, Norfolk Fire Rescue down in Norfolk, Virginia. Yes, sir. Beauty. Beauty. Well, welcome to the show, Josh, and uh, can't wait to dig into some. Uh, I, I, I kind of see you as a very progressive, innovative uh, thinker in the fire service. One of those, one of those ones who's going to make change as you, well, you're already making change, but you're going to make yeah. more change as your time goes on in the fire service. So it's a real honor to have you on the show today. No, I really appreciate that. I mean, that's always my goal. I mean, I always tell people like my goal is strengthen, encourage, and empower. And those are my three things. And if I can do those things while I'm here, then, you know, that's, that's obviously it. I'm hundred percent, you know, the heart behind everything I do is to help. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, some of the delivery, sometimes people might ask, like, how is that helping? Because I do tend to tell what I believe is the truth, you know, and that doesn't always line up with everybody. And, uh, you know, but sometimes the truth hurts and sometimes it hurts me as well. It's not just other pe people. And I think it's one of those things where if you're offended, it's kind of, OK, well, I got to look at myself if I'm offended and figure out why I'm offended. You know, so, but I appreciate you saying that I really am, you know, trying to move this whole thing forward. The last thing I want to do is go back and I have a lot of learning to do too. You know, I'm, I'm 41, I'm still young in here and, uh, you know, 19 years on the job, but I still feel pretty young in life, you know, with a lot that I've been through. So I'm, I'm still a rookie when I'm looking around, there's guys <laughs> way my senior that are like, you're a pup kid, you yeah. know, and uh, but, they've but seen you're starting more, to pave more. the way, right? So you're paving yeah, the way. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about who Josh is and kind of your background bringing you to the fire service today. Yeah, sure. 
So uh, my name is Josh Chase. I'm married. I got three kids. Uh, I say three kids, but they're like monsters now. My daughter is uh, 22, going on 23. Uh, she's getting ready to move out, which is awesome. Uh, good and bad. You know, I'm not excited to see her go, but another chapter of her life. And my son is turning 18 this year. He's 17. We just gave him the keys to a Honda. And he's pretty stoked about that today. He's out there cleaning it right now. We told him, if you take care of it, you can have it when you're 18. He immediately went to the garage, got the vacuum, and started cleaning <laughs> it, which is amazing. That's awesome. And I got a, a daughter who is 15, going on 35, and she's pretty awesome. Um, she's she's me, just a female version, so it's kind of cool. But um, no, so I got three kids. They keep me busy. My wife keeps me on track. Uh, one of the most, if not the most supportive people that I've ever met in my life. And I think, I think that's one of the qualities I saw when I was dating. I was like, this chick, no matter what, will always stand by me and never quit on me, no matter what I go through, which I've needed. You know, I've been through a lot of stuff. So, um, but yeah, so I've been in the fire department almost uh, about 19 years now. And I uh, did some military time before that. I was a Black Hawk helicopter crew chief uh, for the United States Army. So I worked on helicopters, crewed helicopters. I was a door gunner on the helicopters. Uh, I got to do stuff with some special forces guys that were in and out of our helicopters doing some cool stuff. Uh, stuff you talk about, stuff you can't talk about. I got to do a lot of stuff while I was in the military. So learned a lot of leadership lessons in the military, learned a lot of self-accountability, um, ownership. I learned a lot of things that I still apply today and a lot of who I am. Uh, I learned in the military real young and I was able to apply that to life and the fire service and kind of got me where I am today, whether it was positive or negative. And you know, me and my wife were talking the other day and she said, you know, you, you had an opportunity a lot of guys didn't have. You joined the military and they taught you a lot of things at a young age. And everybody does have that opportunity. That's a choice that I made. And for me, I needed it. I, you know, I, I didn't have a whole lot of guidance when I was young. I had a daughter when I was 18 years old, my daughter, you know, now, but I had her when I was 18 years old and wasn't sure what I was going to do. Knew I didn't want to be just a statistic. And, you know, me and my girlfriend back then, we got married and worked all that stuff out, but I have a lot of guidance. And so the military really provided me that guidance, got out of there, joined the fire department. And, um, you know, it, that, that a lot of the practical foundation, I would say of who I am and the decisions that I make are military fire department. And, um, the foundation of who I am is definitely faith-based. I was raised in a faith community and, uh, kind of always lived off of those principles. It's evolved over the years. It, it's definitely changed. You know, I think for years I was living off my parents' faith. Now I'm kind of living off my own faith. Mm -hmm. And um, so very different. Like I said, it's evolved. But at the end of the day, like if I had to sum it all up, I would just tell you my name is Josh and I like going to fires. I mean, <laughs> that's 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 really what I would say. I, I would love to say we get to do that as much as I love to do it. Um, it's great for the citizens that we don't get to do it as often um, because that's one thing that I've been kind of in conversations with lately is you know, it, it's a great job. I love what we do. I still run EMS with the, I'm on the engine. I still run EMS with the medic. We get to help a lot of people, but we also get to a lot of, see a lot of people that really need help. And I think over the years, you know, that weighs on you, you know, you know, people are passing away in unexpected situations and fire is pretty destructive. And it's fun for us because we get to go in there and we get to do, we train to do, and we, we stopped, you know, what we could stop, but there is always that family that's affected or families you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, that's me. Uh, I'm 41. I've been through a lot. I've seen a lot, done a lot. I have a lot to go through, uh, through and through. I'm a family man. My marriage and my family is my priority. Uh, everything else comes after that. And I, I think I, I recognize that and realize that it hasn't always been that way, but it's kind of how I got where I am today. I I was going to be my question. Has, has it always been like that? Cause I know that's something yeah. that we all struggle with, right? Is that balance of the fire life and, and home life, right? So no, no, and it hasn't, it, um, it definitely has not. And I think, you know, I would have loved to tell you that my marriage and my family was always a priority, but it, it has not always been that way because I think a lot of us do struggle with that. And some of us handle it way better than others. And I think younger in my career, I just didn't handle it. Well, um, I was, you know, married, um, I was about 20, 21 years old when I first got married. But right when I got married, I found out I was getting deployed to Iraq. So I got married and found out, hey, you're getting deployed in 90 days. You know, we kind of had a, hey, you might be leaving, you know, and they were like, this is a pretty strong, you might be leaving, you know. So um, so it was there. We kind of had a warning. They kind of let us know this could be happening. I had already had plans to, you know, get married anyway. 
And, um, you know, so I got married three months later, I was boots, you know, training mm-hmm. on for almost 18 months total. Um, in that time that I had gotten married in that three months, I'd actually got hired in the fire department and I got hired in the fire department. I was doing the academy. So my academy was suspended, which was great. I got to keep my job. Uh, academy was suspended. I got deployed with the army, did all my crew chief stuff and went to war in Iraq. Uh, um, Operation Iraqi Feet Freedom 2005. I was deployed about 18 months total with train ups, uh, actual year boots on ground in country. So you can imagine three months being married to my high school sweetheart. Uh, we had a four year old at the time and then found out we were pregnant before I left. Came back mid deployment to see my son who was born while I was gone. Mm. Went back, uh, finally got back, like I said, almost 18 months total. Took a little time off, jumped right into the fire academy, and I just wasn't handling things right. You know, back then, this was 2007, and we weren't really talking about post-traumatic stress, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. They were kind of bringing stuff up, but it's nowhere near as prevalent as it is now. And I mean, I had every, I had every trigger, every symptom, everything you could think about about a man that has just been gone from his family that came back a completely different person from war and then jumped right into another high speed career that really almost made me feel at home. But that became my home to the point where we're talking about not handling marriage correctly. The fire department really came the thing that I really identified and was comfortable with. And I mean, I was more comfortable being at work than I was being at home because there was just chaos. I was at a a young house with some motivated guys and we, we were busy. And, um, I don't know how many conversations I had with my wife back then. I'm pretty sure you love the fire department more than you love me. And I honestly couldn't argue with her. And it wasn't that I loved the fire department more. She could tell that I was just comfortable in that chaos versus home chaos because I didn't know how to connect. You know, I had no idea how to connect back then. And that led to, uh, I mean, I don't know how many marriage problems, probably normal things that guys just think they're going through, but you know, and now I can look back and say, oh, I know exactly what this is because I've tackled some of these issues. But yeah, that led to, you know, we were married in 2005, 2012, uh, they call it the seven year itch, but it just happened to be the year where everything broke loose for us, where I hadn't dealt with any of my mental health problems. We were winging in our marriage. I was doing shift work. She was doing shift work. Uh, I'd been living a double life, you know, just doing whatever, hanging out with whoever, doing single guy stuff and almost got divorced in 2012, you know? So no, I have not always handled this well at all. hundred percent. No. Yeah. As a young fireman, I was a mess, you know, and, and mental health for me was not a focus at all. I was just going to do the job, be great at the job and excuse me, figure my family out. Man, I was not figuring out family because it wasn't comfortable. So it was not great. Can you pinpoint a time where your your that light bulb went on? It was like, all right, I gotta change yeah. how I show up each day. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So uh two thousand and twelve, like I said, was like the year of I don't know if I can do this anymore. And um, like I said, I was living a double life. I was hanging out with single guys, doing single guy stuff. You know, oh. at one hand I was married at home with kids, on the other hand, I was single, hanging out. Uh, being unfaithful. And, and I mean, that's really what started leading me down this path of, is this who I really want to be? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I ended up having multiple affairs, um, which are my choice and, you know, not something that I'm proud of. And just because I know the triggers and how I got there doesn't excuse the choice that I made, you know? So it's kind of like people are like, well, I had six beers that justifies my choice. Well, you had, you made the choice to have six beers and you made the choice. You know, same way I just chose not to deal with my problems. I ended up um, trying to connect, not even really connecting with other people. I really was like, this person's not going to expect me to really connect. They don't even know me that well. Um, Ended up leaving my family in 2012, in March of 2012, walked out on my wife, walked out on my kids. I ended up moving in with my girlfriend. Uh, So anybody that's listening to this, if you're married and you have a girlfriend, it's just bad juju it's just not a good idea to be married and have a girlfriend i feel like that's common knowledge but i mean mm-hmm. i it should be common knowledge for me and i was doing it you know so yep but no i think i was i was living with my girlfriend while i was married and for about six months the word that was the worst six months of my life i mean 100 uh, i was trying to be a great dad 
you know, while not being at home. I, I, I don't believe I, I can't be a great dad if I'm not willing to actually stay home, face my problems, fix my marriage and be there for my kids. And, um, you know, that's nothing on somebody who's going through it. That was that was for me. I knew I couldn't be. So about six months of being out of my house, um, like I said, I have a fake background. And I remember just sitting there one day and I was talking to my wife on the phone and we were arguing about whatever. And she had had a boyfriend. I had a girlfriend. I'm like, we're married. What are we, what are we, do, what are we doing? My fault. I, I left, you know, so I left the door open and a light bulb kind of went off when we got off the phone that day. And it was like, hey, you really never fought for your family. You just walked out. And um, I just sat back and I started thinking about the past seven years of my marriage and the deployment and the years at the station and the things that I'd been doing and who I'd become. And deep down, I didn't actually want to be the person that I'd become. I just didn't know how to recover. I didn't know what to do. And I can remember going to the bathroom after that phone call, looking in the mirror and just seeing myself and almost being disgusted. I, I did not like the person that I was looking at. I mean, physically, I could see this person in the mirror and I was like, I don't, I don't like this person. And it's like, if you see a person that you don't like and you're like, ah, something just rubs me the wrong way about them. I was looking at myself and that's how I felt. And that was the point. I really felt like I've never heard the voice of God audibly, you know, anything like that. But I really felt, you know, deep down in my spirit, like I said, I had a firm foundation when it came to God, that God was challenging me to go home and actually fight for my marriage and fight for my kids and actually see what would happen if I pursued my wife with passion and showed her that I loved her. And, you know, my kids would get to see like, okay, dad's back and he's pursuing mom and he's showing her that he loves her and he's doing the right things and he wants to be here. So I really felt challenged to go back and just try. And I, I don't think I'd really tried in a way that made sense um, or that was consistent with what I was telling people that I believed in. So, you know, I don't, I didn't feel like I'd really given God a shot. And I was like, you know, what's the worst that could happen? I'm going to give it a shot. If the God thing doesn't work, then whatever, I'll go back to do what I was doing. You know, for me, it, for me, it worked, you know, and I, I've told my story. I've written a book about my story and I don't push uh, my faith on people. You know, I'm just telling you like, hey, it, it worked for me. You know, I, I tried it and it worked and I'm thankful that it did. Now, I'll be honest, it didn't work right away. I, I, I walked in the door and she agreed to meet with me after I had that light bulb moment and I told her I wanted to come home and she said, no, mm. you know, I'd been gone for six months and she's like, there's no way you're coming back. You know, like you're, you've been out of here. Like, and I was like, well, I want to come home. God's going to fix it. And she's looking at me like, you're nuts. Mm. You know, there's, there's like, I got to see it. And fair, fair enough. She wanted to see it. She wanted to see that I was going to learn to be the husband that she needed. And the one that I promised her to be when, you know, I told her that it was death do us part, you know, or, and the same thing with the kids. She wanted to see that I was going to be the father that she wanted um, for the kids. And I knew I had to do that, you know. So I, I just did what I knew how to do. I, I found a local church and I was like, this is what I do, right? I go back to church and I find people. And uh, one thing I did find was community for me. Like, I don't agree with everything that every single, you know, church or religion does. But for me, I really needed a community that was supportive. And I think that's a big uh, part that sometimes we miss some days as we isolate, we don't have that community, you know, um, found a community in the church, had a good community of, in the fire department that was supportive of me going back home, figuring out my family, uh, started talking to people that had good families, you know, like, Hey, who's been married 30 years and been through stuff. Uh, can you help me? I mean, I'm trying to get my wife back. I've been an idiot. Here's the things that I've done. And they walked me through steps and mm. what I should do. And, you know, and but there was also the reality that I'd made a lot of serious mistakes and she could say, hey, uh, thank you. But no, thank you. But, you know, I'll let you be the best dad you can be. But I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I, yeah. uh, I had a very forgiving, understanding uh, wife. Now, that's not to say that she was not extremely hurt. It's not to say that we didn't have a lot of pain to walk through. Um, I came clean about things she had no idea about. I mean, she had no idea that I'd been unfaithful, had affairs, been doing half the stuff that I'd been doing. She maybe thought, but when I shared the things, it was mind blowing to her and, um, a lot of pain, a lot of stuff we had to work through. And, you know, so that, that probably took about a good three, four months to kind of just work to the point where she let me start coming back to the house and actually staying in the house and working on our marriage and 
making our marriage and family a priority. And then we would work on careers and everything else because we'd never done that before. Um, so yeah, that was my light bulb moment was I'm out of the house. What am I doing? Like, I really want to make this work. And, um, you know, for me, like I said, I chose the God path. Uh, it worked. I think it, I think it will work if people give it a shot. Um, I think you got to give it a wholehearted effort and realize that you have to admit you don't know what you're doing. And for me, I'm a pretty loud, confident, uh, you know, sometimes arrogant, prideful person who has to sit down and say, I don't know it all. Mm -hmm. And when it came to marriage and family, I did not know it all. And I was not doing my family any favors. I had no vision for my marriage. I had no vision for my family. And something I teach guys now is if you don't have a vision for your marriage and your family, there's really no leadership because you have to have vision and a vision and a goal. And, you know, we can be a leader in the fire service, but I'm really big on being a leader at home first. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can go to work and these guys can think I'm amazing. But if I come home and my wife's looking at me, like, where are we staring this ship? That that's a bigger problem for me. And that is where I was. I was on the, on the job. I was great. I was, you know, running and burning buildings, learning the job, uh, risking everything. I mean, I was, I'm not looking, I'm not tooting my own horn back in the day. I'm telling you what other people thought and what our crew looked like. We were the crew that you wanted on the fire scene, but I was toxic. You know, I was, I was great at work. I mean, I was the guy you wanted on the gunshot stabbings. You know, you want to pull people out of buildings to attack fires. Like, but I was, I was toxic, uh, great at my job, but toxic when it came to everything else so yeah i mean uh, so it's it's been a long road to get where i am but it's really shaped who i am today what i talk about what i speak about what i write about um what i encourage other people to be like not like me just a man who's you know humble enough to say i screwed up Mm -hmm. you know you have to be me just yeah yeah. i think it's an Uh, important story right that's an important message for people to hear because there's a lot of people I'm sure listening to this right now who struggle at home uh, with that balance and, and just hearing the success of other people uh, can really start them in that building that community okay. and reaching out, right? The, the yeah. thing that jumps into my mind is you, you're a, a warrior and a fighter in the military. You're yeah. a fighter in the, in the fire service, but yep. you weren't a fighter at home because no. you mentioned that as a fighter and right? you want to go home yep. and fight for your marriage. You're a 100%. fighter in every other aspect of your life at home yeah interesting yeah and that was i think that's what bothered me and that's where that challenge was Mm -hmm. it was and that's what i heard deep down inside was like you're not going to fight for your family and i realized i would fight for everybody else and it wasn't even that i didn't want to fight for my family i didn't know how to fight for my family but then really as i dug deeper in those months of trying to get my family back i realized i didn't even know how to fight for myself So if I didn't know how to fight for myself and learn how to love myself or forgive myself or any of that stuff, how could I effectively fight for a family? You know, something that a good friend of mine always says that you have to be able to give and you want to give generously, but you can only give from strength. I can't give somebody a hundred dollars if all I have is five dollars, you know, so it just doesn't work that way. And really, I was trying to give my family something that I didn't even have for myself. So I kind of, it just wore on me and eventually I gave up. So I really, during those really three months of trying to, you know, get my marriage and family back, um, it was really, I really had to work on my personal stuff and I had to do a lot of, okay, well, I need to forgive myself. I'm not perfect. How can I, what, what happens? Like if this doesn't work, I still need to be okay. And, but yeah, I mean, I was a, a war fighter, a firefighter, done some cool stuff. I'm like, let's go out there and do this. Let's go out there and get them. Let's attack. And I was sitting back and, you know, kind of just letting things happen to my family, not realizing how important it is. Um, Now, I know that now, but not realizing how important it is for a man to step up, you know, and be the person that he committed to be on that wedding day, if that's what you did, Mm -hmm. and really fight for your marriage and fight for your family. I mean, something I've learned over the years is, You don't have to fight if you don't want to. It is a choice. But there is a fight for your marriage and there is a fight for your kids. It is happening. It is actively happening. And you have a choice whether to engage or to disengage. And if you are not engaged, you are inadvertently disengaged. But there is somebody. There is. Look at the world. 
I mean, if we look at the breakdown of the family, uh, with the breakdown of marriages, you know, at the breakdown of men and fatherhood and fatherlessness, especially in the United States, we have a really big problem, you know? So it is so important that, that these men, and I was one of them, which is, I'm so thankful that I've been through a lot of this stuff because now I can speak to it, not as, Hey guys, you need to get your stuff together. Like, no, mm -hmm. I've been through it. And I'm telling you, it's just not great. And I mean, I watched myself almost single-handedly take out my family. And now I've learned, you know, 10 years ago now, almost almost 11 years ago, I learned how important it is to fight for your marriage, fight for your kids, fight for their purpose, fight for your purpose. You know, that is 100%. You know, if I, if I walked out of here, off here now, my wife sat down and you asked her questions, she would tell you like, oh yeah, this is it. This these are his priorities now. You know, it's not a, it's not a fad. It's not something that's going to run out. Uh, I've been at the bottom and I really didn't like it, you know, uh, I was used to it just because I've, you know, chaos. And I was like, oh, I could, I could live here, but I really didn't like it. And I didn't have to live like that. And I finally got to a point where I don't have to live like that. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I was, a, I mean, I was a fighter everywhere. <laughs> totally. Except That's what the, the most, yeah. right. Except yeah. for the most important thing yeah. that I was claiming was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that is it's, it's the most important thing now. Man, I wish I wish I could always say it was been that way. I, I I was talking to my wife the other day, and you know sometimes I have flashbacks or memories, and I think, and I'll have a moment of like personal embarrassment, and it's dealt with quickly because I have owned a lot and talked through a lot of stuff, but I'm still not proud, you mm -hmm. know, when I look back and see how I handled things. I'm like, man, I could have handled it so different, you know. Um, but being able to have like work through some of those and talk through those, those moments don't last long. But I'm not I'm not excited about how I handled. You know, life. Um, I am excited about how it's turned out, how the journey's turned out, how things are turning out. You know, um, some people would say, like, man, you got a hell of a comeback story. And I'm like, it's not really a comeback story. I'm still on the journey. You know, I'm still living. You know, there's no, to me, I'm like, there's no comeback story. I think this was, um, you know, a, something that I chose and I could, could choose whatever tomorrow. You know, so it's just imperative that I just continue on this path that I've chosen, you know, not perfect, but, um, and like I said, when I say I have the most supportive wife in the world, I mean, it's, it's freaking crazy. It doesn't make any sense. You know? Gotta meet her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's great. So I know you talk a lot about purpose and finding purpose in your life. Yeah. I'm assuming, I'm guessing from our conversation that purpose was a big part of your recovery of finding yourself and finding out how to yeah. lead yourself. Right. Was that correct? Or? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. No, it was huge. So, you know, just on the back of, of that story, really, once I figured out, like, this can't just be me. There's no way this is just me going through this. There's no way just I've been through this. And like I said, I, I found this, uh, you know, I, I, like I found God again, if you will, you know, but I started to realize the importance that men have, you know, in the world, not just on their families, but in the world as men uh, and purpose and as leaders. Um, especially men and marriages and family, because that was something that I was involved in. So I started to realize, man, men really do play a huge part in this. And as I look back at my marriage, I realized, sure, my wife made choices and she didn't do everything perfect either, but I was responsible to lead and I was not doing that. And I started to look around and just started to observe and see that I'm not the only one going through this. I've chosen this path. It worked. I think I could, I think I could help a few people. You know, so about 2013 is where I really felt called to men and help men in marriage and family. I was like, I'm going to do men, marriage and family. This is how I want to help. Uh, this is really what I feel called to do. And, you know, I told my wife she thought it was great. She knew what we'd been through. She was willing to share everything. She's like, we could share whatever we want as long as it'll help people, which so thankful for her. You know, so that I really started kind of working it out. Like, what's this going to look like? I had an idea. I know I want to help men. I know I'm called to men um, because I've seen firsthand what not fighting for your family can do. I've seen firsthand what a man without purpose can do, the damage he can do, uh, the wandering, the, the, the being lost and not having vision or mission or passion. I've seen what it can do because I've lived it, you know, and I, I wanted to make sure guys had purpose and were living for purpose. Um, I mean, I think a man with purpose is a man with vision. A man with vision is a man with discipline. You know, it, they all kind of tie into each other. So I really started pursuing that in 2013. And I didn't know what it would look like. 
Uh, I started journaling, trying to figure stuff out. Like I said, I was kind of getting back in my faith, trying to figure out marriage again, because I'd never done marriage the way that I was doing it now. So I was really focused on just really dating my wife again, dating my wife again, being married, just being a dad, being home, being present, uh, learning to balance the job and marriage because I hadn't done that before healthy. So I had a lot of learning to do. You know, it was almost back to square one. Uh, we'd been married seven years, went through this stuff. It was like, it's almost like we agreed to start over and it was good. I mean, marriage was really good. Normal stuff. Yeah. You're arguing about finances and you know, who had the last slice of bread or uh, you had the remote last week, like, you know, dumb stuff, but normal mm -hmm. marriage things, mm -hmm. but it was, it was good. I was learning to be a good husband. I was learning to be a good father. I was open to like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I need to learn how to balance these things. I knew I wanted to help men. So I'm trying to stay on track, fix my problems, pursue my passion, pursue my purpose. So I had a good idea what my purpose was. The next step was like, okay, well, how do I do this? You know, how do I carry this out? Um, I wrote a book uh, 10 years ago, and I, I've unpublished it since then. I've written a couple of different things, but it was very fresh off my experience about what I've been through. And it was very, um, I think religious is the only term I can think to use. It was very religious and you should do this and not really inclusive. You know, it was, if you don't do it this way, you're just going to fail. And I mean, I've since read through that book and I was like, I wouldn't even read this now. You know, mm -hmm. um, it was just too fresh. Um, I'm glad I wrote it. It was the first book I ever wrote. It kind of, it kind of steered me down writing, mm -hmm. you know, so first book I ever wrote self-published, you know, it was, so the process was great. All that was great. I've been writing, I've, I've been writing forever, ever since I was in high school. It's just been a, you know, subconscious way of healing just through stuff I didn't even realize until I got older. Um, but yeah, so I wrote a book. Um, so it's just trying to help guys here and there, but a lo little bit, little by little local guys were hearing my story or. You know, they would hear something at church and I'd get to meet with people here and there. So I was getting help. It was cool. And I was like, man, I'd love to do this on a larger scale. Um, really, our, our pastors at church were like, hey, we, everybody's struggling, you know, like whether it's in church, out of church. And our, our pastors were really open to letting us help couples. And man, I was, it was great. You know, it was like really starting to figure this out. And so this 2012, 2013, I got back home. And so we're hashing that all out. And about 2015, uh, May 2015, um, it, like everything changed. I mean, everything changed in May 2015. It was it was three years of bliss and me being back home and figuring out purpose and figuring out marriage and figuring out life and kids. And I mean, it was great. I'd never lived a life like this before with with my wife. It was awesome. And on May 12, 2015, my whole world flipped upside down. Um, I was on shift the night before, uh, worked 24 hours and, you know, talked to my wife on the phone, like normal, got home in the morning. She was a NICU nurse, uh, a neonatal intensive care nurse at a local hospital. So she had to work the next morning. I was getting off the next morning. So we were doing shift change where she drops the kids at her mom's. I go pick them up. I get the kids to school. She goes to work. We don't see each other that morning. Normal day for us. Uh, we did that two, three days a week. So I decided kids are in school. She's at work. I'm going to clean the garage. You know, no big deal. I got 80s music in the background, cleaning the garage. It's, it's May. It's already getting hot here. We're planning family vacation through text, and I'm cleaning the garage. And I get a phone call probably about 10 or 11 a.m. in the morning that says, hey, you need to get down to the hospital right now. And it's my wife's work. And I'm like, uh, okay, what's going on? And they're like, she passed out. We can't wake her up. We need you to get down here now. And I'm like, okay, sure, I, no problem. Uh, I'll be down there right away. But my, she, no medical history, so I wasn't, you know, hey, something's going on. I just figured she'd passed out, wasn't really sure. And I called the lady back when I got in my truck on the way. And for for some reason, and I still don't know why I asked this question, um, I just said, hey, is she innovated? And uh, I'd been in the fire department. I've been in plenty of scenes, you know, where that's that's the scene and for some reason i asked if she innovated and she said yes and i was like okay this is not good um i don't know why i asked that question but i asked it and when she said yes i knew i needed to get the hospital i needed to get there right away um the hospital was like 35 minutes from my house so it wasn't like a oh quick trip down the road uh it was probably one of the most stressful drives i've ever had you know i'm trying not to get a ticket but also i want to get there fast 
you know, uh, it's a military hospital. So I'm like, and are they going to let me on base? I'm not in the military anymore. Um, I get there. They take me into the ER lobby. Three people meet me there. When they find out who I am, they take me to a little room with a cross on the wall and they sit me in a chair and they're like, Mr. Chase, um, you know, we, we need to talk to you. And I'm like, just take me to my wife. And they're like, well, we're going to need you to calm down. And I'm like, this is as calm as I'm going to be. I just need you to take me to my wife. I mean, I already know it's not good at this point. They've put me in this little room. I've put people in that little room at the hospital. You don't get good news in these little rooms off to the side with flowers and crosses on the walls. So I said, okay, we're going to take you to her, but you need to, you know, you just need to be calm when we take you. Um, so we walk down the hallway and they take me in the ER and I can hear all the commotion before we get in the room. And there is my 32 year old wife on the hospital table in full code. And they are doctors, everybody's doing CPR, everybody you can imagine is in that room. And I'm standing there looking at her clueless mm. because there, she wasn't sick. There was no medical history. We were just planning family vacation. And I'm looking at her on this table like, I, I don't really understand what's going on. I understand what's going on, but I don't understand why you're on the table. And uh, um, the doctor looks at me. I kick into EMT mode. And I'm like, how long have you guys been doing this? 45 minutes. I'm like, okay, well, uh, nobody does CPR for 45 minutes. I've never done CPR for 45 minutes in the field. I've never seen them do it for 45 minutes in the hospital. This was the hospital that she worked at. Uh, she knew these people. And I think they were, we have to do everything to get her back. Um, they knew her. Um, some of them knew me. Some of them knew the kids. Uh, they, they worked for 45 minutes because I don't even think they knew they worked for 45 minutes. Honestly, finally, the doctor looked up and he said, we've actually been at this for 45 minutes. Um, you know, and one of the guys was like, just talk to her, man, just talk to her. And, you know, I, I was like, what? Not talk to her. I, I don't know what's going on. You know, and I got down, I said something, I don't even remember. I just remember the doctor looking at me and saying, Hey, Mr. Chase, we're going to try one more time. And they did. They went through everything. They tried one more time and he looked at me and he looked at the clock and he looked at me and I just said, call it. And, you know, at 32 years old, I pronounced my wife, my dad, you know, in a hospital, um, no expectation of how that day would go. I thought we were going to plan family vacation. She'd come home that night, you know, um, and that was it. They, everybody slowly kind of trickled out of the room tears you know some patted me on the shoulder they had a chaplain there for me i was i mean obviously in shock you know i was 32 years old wondering what just happened um you know it was it was in a moment my whole life changed and i remember walking outside shortly after she passed away talking to the chaplain saying i have i don't know what's going on how come i don't feel anything and he just said son you're going to feel a lot, just not today. You got a lot to go through. And uh, there was some construction in the background, and I can still remember hearing the specific construction. This They were pile driving. I can just hear the bing of the pile driving over and over and over. And I'll never forget that sound. That was when I realized I have to tell my kids mm -hmm. that their mom has passed away, and they're in school. What? Wait a minute. Is this happening? You know, so now I'm outside the hospital realizing that I am now a single dad at 32 that has to go home and tell his kids that their mom has passed away. And I do not have a reason and I have no idea. Um, and to date, I can say to date, honestly, that is probably the hardest, if not one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life is to look at my kids and tell them, hey, your mom passed away. And she's not coming home. You know, at the time, my kids were 12, 12 years old, six years old, and five years old. Uh, my wife now would probably correct me because I'm terrible with ages, but they were pretty, they were pretty young. Um, you know, I, I always get it within a year, but 12, six, and five. And, um, you know, I got home that day and I chose not to take them out of school. You know, I, I just got, I had to go home. My, my friends got me home. I was trying to drive home. They're like, you're not driving home. Um, you know, your wife just passed away. I was in complete shock, you know, so I get home and, um, 
you know, one by one, my kids are getting off the bus and one by one, I'm delivering news that I would never, ever thought I would have to deliver to my young kids. And um, my daughter, who was older at the time, my, my 22 year old now, uh, she was about 12. And so she, she understood it obviously more than a five year old and six year old, you know, as much as you can at 12, she understood that mom was not coming home you know no matter how much she wanted to she understood death is okay she's not coming back uh the five and six year old i you know they wanted to go outside and play after i delivered the news you know they they're not grasping you know now they're older now there's stuff we've had to work through obviously um but that still is probably the hardest thing i've ever had to do is to look at my kids you know and then the shock of that week uh, what we'd already been through that I shared and what we'd made it through, you know, it, it made, um, it didn't make, it, it almost made those years to me. Like, why did I have to go through that? Like, what was the point? What was the point of us almost getting divorced? I mean, making these choices and finding my purpose only for her to die, you know? So I really struggled. I mean, with no answers, I had an autopsy done, you know, she, um, wow. she, they just said she, had a seizure. Wow. She had a seizure, went into cardiac arrest, and she passed away. Mm, and I, yeah, I'm like, okay, mm. well, why? And they're like, you, you know, Mr. Chase, you know as well as we do that some of the the seizure stuff really is unexplained. Some seizure activity can come out out of nowhere, and some people just have seizures for the rest of their life, and they go on medication. She just had a really bad one, and sent her into cardiac arrest, and we couldn't bring her out of it. Oh. You know, so. Wow. Um, talk about a challenge. Mm. I mean, yeah, and uh, finding my purpose, and then being challenged to do I even want to pursue purpose? To do I even want to pursue continuing to live? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, you, you talk about struggle. I literally lost my best friend, my high school sweetheart, the woman I had kids with that I was going to tackle this purpose and passion with for the rest of my life, and now she's gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one of the most selfish things that I had to deal with over those coming months was I honestly just didn't want to be here anymore. And I'm not talking about I didn't just want to wake up one morning. I seriously struggled with suicide on a daily basis to the point where I had people calling, checking. I gave my weapons away. I just did everything I could know to do because I had the kids to be here for. But even that, you know, was challenging. And I felt so selfish, you know thinking, how could I want to not be here, you know, and I have three kids, but mm -hmm. I, I was, you talk about hopeless and, and I've, I've done enough, uh, done enough and been through enough to understand more about suicide. Not that I understand at all, but I understand more how people get to these places. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a space of pure hopelessness. And mm -hmm. if you've experienced pure hopelessness, it is nothing good. It is nothing good. Nothing good can happen. Nothing good can change. And it is a dark place. And I was definitely there after she passed away. And community, talked about community earlier, uh, church community, fire community, the nursing community she was a part of, the friends that we had made. I mean, I, I honestly, if I did not have people rally around me and, you know, just be there for me, not tell me what to do, not tell me how to handle it. They were just there. Uh, they were there for what I needed. They brought the meals. They they did the things. They took the kids when I needed. They really just got me to a place where I wanted to do life again. And um, hmm. then I had to make decisions. Do I can I stay in the fire department? You know, for a while I thought it was selfish that you know their mom passed away unexpectedly, but I'm going to continue to work in a dangerous career where I don't have to work here. But I'm not going to work in a career where I could die. You know, and I had to work through that with my kids. My youngest daughter really had a problem with that, you know, and, um, but this is what I wanted to do. This is what I felt called to. So I was like, God, do I have any other skills? Not right now. Um, so it was, it was very interesting. And you can imagine I'm still on a grief journey, if you will. For sure. Um, for sure. It looks, it wasn't very it long looks, ago. It was like 10 no, years it was ago. Right? 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, uh, it looks way healthier now. Than it did in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I had no idea how to feel, how to grieve, what to do. Um, I probably did every unhealthy thing you can think about grief, except for hard drugs. You know, um, you know, drank myself into you know oblivion, and 
you know, all kinds of things, isolated, did this. I handled it all wrong because I didn't know how to handle it. You know, thank God I, I did have people who, you know, if I had a bad night or I had a bad day that were like, Hey, okay, well maybe we don't have a week of those, or maybe we don't have two weeks of those, you know, or they started to see a pattern they jump in and just, I had people that really knew me and knew how to help me. And I think that's important that I developed those relationships during those three years that me and my wife are really focusing on making things work, but some dark places, um, ended up in the training division when I wanted to come back to work. I took, I took almost four months off just to refocus and get my family back on track and get my kids back on track. And I had a really good friend of mine that had moved to the training division as a chief. They were looking for a training instructor, perfect timing for me to jump in, um, you know, got to do the eight to five be there from well, not really eight to five. Anybody that's been in training knows it's <laughs> you, you come in when you come in and you leave when you leave. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as a single dad, that became challenging, you know, cause it was come home. I had, you know, 26 kids at work I was dealing with, you know, and then I was coming home to my three kids and making sure homework was done and baths are getting taken and dinner's getting ready and no time to myself at night. By the time I was done with them, I had to go to bed cause I had to be up for the academy in the morning. And, you know, so after about a year of that, my mom stepped in, pretty much moved into my house 10 days a month to watch my kids. And that allowed me to transition back to the street, been on the street ever since. And that hasn't all been easy. I mean, the seizure calls, honestly, in the beginning were hard because it was like, so this person's going to have a seizure. We're going to give them medicine and they're going to live. Right. But my wife died, you know, um, so, but I did, I jumped back in and like, I'm still on a journey. I met my wife now about two and a half years later. Um, you know, and, and we were, we worked through all that and, you know, but mm. that, that was challenging in itself. Like I'm, you know, lost somebody that I was in love with, remarried, still, still grieving, but we've learned to walk through so much now. And she's helped me walk through so much healthy, you know, she saw things that I didn't see, right. you know, so yeah. she, she got me to a counselor, you know, she got me to the right people. She got me talking to the right people. You know, she got, my wife now got me talking to people about, you know, the, my military experiences and my, my trauma from the military back in 2006 and 2007, you know, she, she, you know, and then when I started working through that, she asked challenging questions like, well, have you ever talked to anybody about the stuff you've seen in the fire department? And, you know, I'm like, well, hang on a second. You know, I already tackled that can of worms. I got to open this one too, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. she really has challenged me, you know, to tackle these things and, but has also been here and been supportive at any crossroads I've come to or seasons of I can't do this or, um, you know, it's, it has been a hard road, uh, to get where I'm at, but mm -hmm. I can say that looking back when I discovered that purpose and then I started going through all these hard things, I was like, if I'm still standing and making a decision not to quit and doing life with community and doing life with God, People can do this. And, and I really started to see how resilient um, I'd become. And, and not by choice. If I had to choose, I would never have chosen um, the way my life turned. I just wouldn't have chosen those things. Now, I wouldn't change them now just because it really has contributed to who I am today. And I think the impact that God's going to allow me to have, um, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have chosen those things. But it made me resilient. I look mm -hmm. back and I can see like it, it has inadvertently made me resilient, but also I had to make a choice to do some of it healthy and not all right. But I think in the back of my mind, I'm like, I want to do this right. I got to figure it out. And that's where my don't quit mentality comes from. That's where my, like, I don't care, push forward mentality comes from. I'm, I don't feel like I'm any different than any other individual. I think I make different choices. Um, but I don't feel like I'm any different when guys are like, I don't understand how you did it. And I'm like, welcome to the club. You can be in my club. I mean, I don't understand how I've tackled all this either. Um, um, not my choice to go through it, but it was my choice and how I responded to it. And I, I've just decided that, you know what? I got two choices and, and, and I really could just, nobody I think would fault me for saying, I'm going to move to Costa Rica. I've lived a hard life so far. And 19 years in the fire service, lost a wife at 32, was a single dad for a little while. That was hard. Been to war, been in burning buildings, almost died, did all these things. I'm going to move to Costa Rica and I'm just going to chill. I don't think anybody would say anything, but what kind of hope would I be spreading? Right. 
And, and, and I think that's my biggest thing now is, um, I love leadership. I love the fire service. I love the, the jump seat leadership platform that I've been allowed to have. I love the followers. I love the books. Um, it really does come from, you know, a, a place in my heart where I want people to be better and do better. But if you look through all my books, if you look through who I am, if you look through my story, you look through where I'm going, what I've done, I'm just carrying a message of hope. To me, I have a lot of favorite four-letter words, to be completely honest, but <laughs> hope is definitely at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to quote Star Wars, uh, mm -hmm. rebellions are built on hope. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yeah. hope is such a thing that I think we're in such need of these days where if you can find one, just one thing to live for, and, and I had to do that. I had to grasp, I had to find that one thing. And for me at that time when it was really hard and it was really dark and I don't want to be here anymore, my kids were that one thing. They were the one thing that I would hold on to. Like, I, I have to be there for them. I don't know how to do it, but I know I need to be here for them. And, and that was my one thing. And now being through what I've been through, I'm like, man, I have so many stories of handling things poorly, handling things right. Uh, in the middle of handling things, support that I've gotten, support that I haven't gotten, support that I should have gotten, supportive people, you know, a supportive wife and then an almost divorce and then she passes away and then meeting somebody else who is just as, if not more supportive, you know, I, now I have this story of really hope woven in and out of my life through all these experiences and I can't move to Costa Rica and not share. People need this. Yeah, so. 100%. That's my trajectory. I am on a mission to spread hope. Uh, thank God I get to do it through a message of leadership because I do believe it's self-accountability, it's ownership, it's leadership. You have to, I have to be going somewhere that's attractive for people to want to follow me. Like that's part of leadership. You know, somebody says, hey, I'm going somewhere. Do you want to go? Well, the first thing I want to know is where they're going. And if you tell me you're going to uh, you know, Krispy Kreme donuts and I'm a Dunkin' Donuts guy, I'm not going, I'm not following you. But if you tell me you're going to this awesome donut shop and I, I haven't had a donut in like five years, but now, you know, I'm using donut analogy, but oh. you know, you know what I'm getting at? Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things like as, as leaders, I think we, we have to realize not even as leaders, as people that want to lead or, or want to spread a message or, or maybe it's hope. Well, where, where am I going? And my goal is to help people. And I want to take people along on that journey, wherever they're at in the journey, you know, and I'm not, I'm not perfect. I don't have my journey figured out. I'm still in the middle of it. And that's but I refuse not just to share the message. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. what makes it beautiful. If you're not perfect, you're just like everyone else, right? Everyone mm -hmm. else. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious to, during this journey of losing your wife, did your faith kind of disappoint you or, or fall apart or did you lose any faith? during that time because of how could this happen to my wife at 32 years old uh, or, 100%. or was your faith there the whole time? Nope. I would 110% say that I, mm -hmm. you know, in any way that sh anything that I thought about God was 110% challenged. Everything was challenged. Everything I learned, everything I believed, uh, everything I told people the past three years, everything I told myself, everything was challenged when she died. Um, everything, all of it. There, there was not a, it wasn't, I wasn't one of those guys that was like, everything's going to be fine. I just got to sing songs in church on Sunday. No, I was the guy in the backyard when my kids went to bed, yelling at God, not even knowing if he was listening. I mean, that was me. My neighbors were probably like, uh, dude lost his wife. We're just going to let him yell. Right. Um, you know, it was, no, everything was challenged. I learned, um, really that I learned more about how to read the Bible, how to sing songs, how to serve on a church team, how to give it an offering plate than I did about actually having a relationship with uh, God, who to me is Jesus, that who I believe created me and came and died for me so I, I could live a life that he's called me to. I had learned a system. I had learned, okay, you do these things and everything's going to be fine and you go to heaven. My faith was challenged to the point where I didn't know what to believe anymore um, because I was in a place where songs on Sunday weren't helping me you know dropping money in an offering plate wasn't helping me reading my bible wasn't helping me none of that stuff was helping me and and the closest example that i had to what a relationship with god a relationship like a relationship like you know that you would develop with anybody you have to talk to them you spend time with them you know you, you figure it out right the closest example that i had to that was my wife 
you know, she had a relationship with God and it didn't look like mine. Maybe she wasn't in her Bible every day, but she would walk and pray and, hey, I feel like God's saying this. And she didn't do everything perfect. She drank wine, ate cheese and cursed, you know, you know, and it, but that was just part of her life. But there were people that probably tell you like, oh, she drank wine. She believed in God. Like, right. yeah, you know, and uh, I, I learned a very religious side of my faith where I would just follow t systems because I'm task oriented. If you give me a system, I'll just follow the system because it makes mm -hmm. it work. I think it came from when I was in the military. You do this, this, and this. You follow this rank structure. It's all good. Sure. Now, I, I do believe that as you have relationships with people, like you get to learn them and what makes them happy and what makes them sad. And, you know, you're not going to do the things that make them sad if you know they make them sad. So I think in the same for me, I had to learn to have a relationship with, with God, like a relationship, like I can sit and talk to you. Okay, I got to learn how to do, I don't know how to do that. I just thought I just prayed and made a request to heaven. And then if it didn't happen, I would just make another one. And so my faith has definitely evolved over the years, but yeah, everything was challenged. Faith, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Why? Not if that happens. Yeah. There's no way. But now, now it's so strange. You know, I don't even want to call it strange. I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's life, but I look back and I can see, oh, okay. Like there is a verse in the Bible that talks about God will work everything for good. And I think it, it is about trust. I, ha I had to learn to trust him again. And I don't know that I even really trusted him the way that I should have in the first place, you know? So for me, when I say like, um, I've chosen this path and this is work, work, what's worked out for me, it's probably not conventional in the sense that people would call Christianity, if you will. I think if somebody had to define it, that's the word they would choose because there's no other word to choose it. But it's so Christianity has its own kind of um, stereotypes these days, right? You know, right. somebody says, hey, you're a Christian. And I say, yes, they're thinking about what they've seen, done, heard, not maybe like, yeah, I OK, I believe in God. I have a relationship with Jesus. I believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, I sit and talk and, you know, I do my quiet time, but I'm probably I'm not perfect. And I really had to discover what my faith looked like. You're like, well, so what is, what is this? Is this real? Or is this just a system that I bought into? And the more I dove into it, I broke more away from a systematic religion or a systemic religion and more into a relationship with God. Um, and now I still go to church on Sundays. You know, I still do things that people would probably consider religious. You know, I'm not against any of those things. We go to a church I've been going to for 10 years, the same church me and my first wife went to. Been a lot of great people there. I do community with people that believe the same things. Um, but I would think the the stereotypical Christian life where it's just a religious system, I was like, this isn't working for me. You know, and and if, you know, I'm not gonna get into a theology lesson or a Bible lesson here, but if you actually go back and and read and actually study some of the historical parts of the Bible and Jesus, you know, it's really more about a relationship with God than anything else. Right. It's it's not about the religion. If anything, you know, short Bible lesson, Jesus kind of came to get rid of a lot of the stuff that we created as humans to mm -hmm. remind everybody, hey, you can have a relationship with God. You don't have to do all these crazy things. Mm -hmm. You might want to do some of these things because you have a relationship with this person and, you know, it makes them happy. Just like if I have a relationship with my wife and I know she likes flowers, guess what? I'm going to buy her some freaking flowers, mm -hmm. you know, like yep, now people yep. might say that's a religious act because I know she likes flowers. So I buy her flowers every Wednesday. I don't do that. She's going to listen to this and be like, you don't buy me flowers every Wednesday. But just the example, that would yep. be, con be considered a religious act that I have to do for my wife, but it's yep. not, yep. you know? So yep. that's, that's kind of how my faith evolved to where I am now. And I'm, I'm still on a faith journey. I am learning so much about um, but I think it's cause I'm open to it. You know, there, are, I've learned more about God outside of Sunday morning. You know, if, if all I'm doing is, you know, and I'll equate it to the fire service here. If all you're doing is spending an hour, uh, an hour and 15 minutes a week, really the message is about 35 minutes. If all you're doing is spending 35 minutes on something that you claim to be a part of and love for an entire week, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you're really that invested. You know, and for me, I was like, this is more than just Sunday morning. If I'm going to have a relationship with somebody that I think is my creator that I'm claiming, this is for me, this is my relationship. And I can't let somebody else be responsible for this. Just like I can't let somebody else be responsible for the progression of my career in the fire service. If you're only going to give me 35 minutes of training as an officer once a week, it's not your fault that I'm not a good fireman. It's my fault that I'm not using those other 
six and a half, seven days to really strengthen who I am as a fireman. And that's how I approach my faith. I'm, I want to have a good relationship with God because I want to lead my family. I want to lead my kids. I want to help my wife walk in her purpose. I want to help my kids walk in their purpose, you know, and I'm a normal guy. I'm not walking around with my Bible thumping people in the face. Like I'm normal. Mm -hmm. I went to the mountains mm -hmm. last week and sat around a fire and drank bourbon, probably drank too mm -hmm. much bourbon, yep. you know, yep. smoked yep. cigars, sat around and it was awesome. I had a great time, mm -hmm. you know, and probably told a story I shouldn't tell. Like I am a human <laughs> being that yeah. is a, that that's a guy that is working out life and trying to do it right. But I think that's what people miss is I have a relationship with God. He knows I'm not perfect and I'm not using that as an excuse to go out there and do whatever the hell I want. I'm trying to figure out daily, Hey, does this line up with the mission you've called me to? And, and to bring it all back around, that's where the purpose comes in. I know my purpose. I know what God's called me to. I know he's called me to strengthen, encourage, and empower men to live out and find their purpose. I know that. So if it doesn't line up with what I'm supposed to be doing, for me, it's easy. I just kick it to the curb. Right. But to not have a purpose, it's, it's just tough. And, you know, I'm not, not knocking any guy who hasn't found it or is struggling with it or is in the middle of it. It's, it's just hard. It's a hard life because you do become a wanderer in a sense. And... Uh, if you're married, your wife can become a frustrated wife who is wandering and doesn't even know it, you know, and, and you wonder why your kids are wandering. And it, it could be that. I'm not saying it's always that. Um, a lot of the times it is, but there's not an end all, the end all for everything either. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. But. Wow. It's been a pretty, uh, pretty powerful story of your, your journey. And, and I just appreciate how much that you see it as a journey still. And that's not the, the end, right? You've, you've already you've already said it several times that you are in a journey that's going to probably go until the day you die. Right. That yeah, it's yeah. not, a, oh, I'm, I've done that part and I'm moving on. Right. So I'd love for you to share maybe a nugget, or if you got a couple of nuggets on people who are listening right now who are struggling in this, maybe the same kind of situations that you went through. Um, how, what's the first things they could look at and what's the first things they could do to maybe find some purpose in life again? Yeah, I think I think honestly, the first thing that I had to do and the first thing anybody could do, and it's probably honestly the hardest thing is you got to be honest with yourself. And I think a lot of us, a lot of us know where we are at. A lot of us know where we're at. We've been here for a while. Uh, some of us know what changes we need to make and we don't, we're not doing them, you know, and, and it's not always because we don't want to do them. Um, sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's ego. Uh, sometimes it's just overwhelming. The amount of changes that we feel like we would have to make uh, are so massive that we just don't want to tackle them. So we continue, we acquiesce, really. We go back to what we know, what we always do. We just do the same things over and over and over, thinking that, well, I can just live this healthy path, this pattern, but it actually does slowly become worse. So I think the first thing, honestly, the first thing for me was what I was when I got that challenge. And if you're listening to this and you're feeling challenged, Take this moment as your challenge. Don't wait for God to come speak to you, you know, after your wife who's left you or who you've, who you've left, you know, is on the phone with you. This, this can be your challenge. This can be your moment, but you have to be honest. And for me, when I got that challenge, the first thing I had to do was be honest about where I was as Josh, where I was as a man, where I was as a husband, where I was as a father. And I had to kind of break that down. I was, I had to be honest about here is where I am at. And then it was okay, I don't, do I like this? Do I not like this? I think most of us that want to change, once we sit down and we actually start being honest with ourselves, we'll discover we actually don't like where we're at. Not that we don't like ourselves, but we may not like our current position. And I think the first thing we all have to do is it's just to be honest. And a lot of the times we're really good at being honest with other people and telling them where they're at and where they're going or what they don't need to do. I give great advice to other people that I don't take for myself. And I think a lot of people are really good at that. There's a lot of people out there like me who are like, man, I just gave some great advice to the coaching session. But the entire time I was coaching that individual, I was also coaching myself because I'm listening to myself talk thinking, I need to do some of this this week. So I think honestly, honestly, uh, <laughs> you have to be honest. You have to be truthful with yourself. And I think that's, that's extremely hard to do. Now, once you're honest with yourself and you figure out this is where I'm at and I need to make some changes. You have to have some sort of goal. You have to. You have to have some sort of goal. And I think the biggest thing, and I'll use the term faith, um, 
I think, you know, we'll take it back to the old song, you know, you got to have faith. So, but you do have to have faith that something actually can change. Something can be better. So you have to have faith for that. If I don't believe it's going to happen, I'm not going to work towards it. So once I'm honest, I think I have to have faith for the situation to actually change. So now I'm thinking I'm honest. I believe this can change. And if I really believe it can change, I will take the necessary steps to make sure it changes. Because to me, if I'm believing something can change, faith breeds vision. So once there's faith, there's vision. There's, okay, I believe this can happen. Will you believe what can happen? I believe this can happen. And now your vision becomes your goal. And that becomes the thing you work towards. So now you have a worthy goal. For me, it was my marriage and my family. I believed it could happen. I was having faith for it. So everything I did, work, I worked towards that one thing that I wanted. So that's what created, it was the vision. It wasn't, you don't need more discipline. Nobody needs more discipline. You need more vision. You need a worthy goal. You need something that is so crazy, like you're so passionate about. For me, it was my family. And I think any guy that's out there doesn't have this passion for his family, like, hey, it's just time to look for it. That's okay. Let's get on board. Let's rediscover a passion for your marriage and family. We can do that. But you get that vision. That vision is what breeds discipline. And initially, it's going to feel good, right? You're going to get that vision and you're going to feel that motivation because motivation is a feeling and it's going to feel great. You're going you're gonna to get going and then something's going to happen and it's going to suck. That's where the discipline comes in. You pick the worthy goal. I don't care if it feels good. I don't, because not everything feels good. Not everything in life feels good. And even if you're doing life bad, you're still going to run into things that don't feel good. So let's start working toward these goals. Create that faith, create that vision, create that mission. That's where the motivation and the discipline comes from. I think a lot of the times we're like, I'm going to do these tasks this week. Why? What's the vision? What's the mission? What is the vision? And I think that those are the two biggest things that I would say for people. If you're talking, thinking about just discovering anything is you have to be honest with yourself. And you have to have faith and vision for it to get better, like faith to get better, vision to help you accomplish it. And I think a lot of the times we do, we just, we're going to do more disciplined things. Discipline is not going to help you in 2024. It's just not. If you do not have a vision, why are you being disciplined? Oh, well, I want to lose 30 pounds just because I want No, look, I try and stay in shape because I want to run around my grandkids. I want to be on dirt bikes with my grandkids. I want to be on four wheelers. I want to be out on land shooting. I want to play paintball. I don't want to be the granddad that they just sit in granddad's lap because that's all I can do. Yeah, heck yeah, I want to sit in that chair and then fall asleep on me and me go to sleep. But I don't want to be that the only thing I can do. Yep, you know, okay. so you, ha you got to have vision, but you got to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to have faith for change. And I think that's what really breeds vision. And then I truly honestly believe everybody's created for a purpose everybody. And it doesn't have to be some crazy thing. Like I'm not out here calling guys to this crazy, uh, maybe you should go out there and speak and change the world or travel to Uganda or travel to Russia or just, you know, I'm picking random countries, but honestly, mm -hmm. if we could just get men to understand how important they are as individuals and that they're created for purpose and, and these married men, especially that they have a wife that is counting on them and a marriage and kids, that is a pretty awesome and worthy calling just to be a, an amazing husband who is stick by his wife's side for, for years and who honors the oath. You know, we talk about honoring an oath to our fire departments, honor the oath to your marriage that you made to your wife and your kids. That is a pretty worth. I have nothing wrong with a guy who says, I'm going to go to work every day and I'm going to love my wife and I'm going to love these kids. And I'm going to make sure my wife walks in her purpose and I'm going to love her and show her what it's like. And I'm going to raise good kids. That is pretty awesome. Like, and that guy can sit in the background and live out his purpose and never has to be on TV or write books or travel. Okay. That's pretty awesome. You yeah. know, and I think, I think there's a lot of guys that listen and think like, oh, I hear Josh, I'm not going to travel, write books, do podcasts, do jump seat leadership, do the fire department stuff. You're not me. I don't expect that out of you. Like, that's not your purpose. My purpose is not your purpose. And if you feel like, I can be purposeful at home, man. I think that's awesome. I think yeah. that's awesome. If we get guys to start there, I'd be good with that. Yeah. yeah. And it's the only thing that's going to be with you until the day you die. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I can't take any of this with me. No, 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 no. You know, I, I do believe at some point I'm going to be held accountable for the way that I live my life, you know, good or bad. I think it's going to be like, Hey, so what do you think? Well, it's going to be me standing there. You know, it's not going to be me and jump seat leadership. It's not going to be me and my books. It's not going to be me and my money. It's not going to be my accomplishments. I really could believe it's going to be, how did you handle 
your life? How did you love people? How did you love your wife? How did you love your kids? You know, I'm out here loving everybody else, but I don't have to love my wife and my kids. That's a problem. Or you know? And it's not a problem. Yeah. And that that's the biggest thing, honestly. We can get guys to just learn how to forgive themselves, love the pel- themselves and release some of this pressure. I love the push right now for men's health because I think it's been annoyed, ignored for a really long time. Yep. Um, men are under attack. We've been under attack for a really long time. Like, I do believe that men are the leaders. I'm not saying uh, women are a weaker species. I don't believe that at all. I think they're awesome. Like, my wife is an amazing leader. She's a great teammate. But I do think men are under their attack. They, they are responsible for leading families. And if I can get the men, I can get the marriage. If I can get the marriage, I can get the family. If you look at what's going on in our country, I don't have to go after the kids. Why would I go after the kids? Like, I'm a war strategist. I went to war. I know war. I've read books on war. I'm going to, I'm going, I don't need, I don't need to attack these little soldiers down here. Why? Why would I do that? I'm going to take out the leaders. Once I take out the leaders, this whole thing's going to fall apart. And that is what's happening. Like, I'll just take out the men. I'll take out the men. I can take out the marriages. Then I'll take out the families. Then I'll just take out generations to follow. It's a sad progression of things that are happening. And it's a, it's an easy strategy. I'm not, I'm not famous, I'm not a war general, you know, but. All you got to do is take out the leader. It, it almost happened to me. I watched it happen to my family. You know, so the leader was out doing whatever. My family's falling apart. The minute I stepped up and s- stood in the place and said, this is my family and I'm going to lead my wife and my kids. It hasn't been amazing all the time, but it's been pretty freaking good. You know, but have I encountered resistance? Yeah. But resistance is the only thing that makes you grow. Like choosing the path of yep. least resistance. I'm not in a gym lifting weights looking for the least amount of resistance. And if I am, I'm not growing. So yes, I'm encountering resistance a hundred percent, but you only encounter resistance if you're moving forward. And I think that is the biggest thing. If I had to leave the podcast with, with any last words or anything like that, I would say one step forward, that's progress. If you take two steps forward and one step back, you still made progress. Some guys, it's just getting out of bed. Some guys, it's just brushing your teeth. And I think we not need to not be so hard on each other. I've been the guy where brushing my teeth was hard. You know, getting out of bed was hard. Getting dressed was hard. You know, after Ashley passed away, there were a lot of things that Dutch didn't want to do. Everything was hard. But I just one step after the other. I had to learn to crawl. Then I had to learn to walk. Then I had to learn to run. Now I run. I sit down when I want. I get back up. I run again. It's It's so much better. But I think, honestly, it's just... I would just challenge people listening to this. What's the next step for you? What's the next step for you? It's different for everybody, yeah. but you have to find out what that next step is for you. And then once you find it out, we love to read. We love to look at things. We love to comment. We love to post memes. We love revelation, but we don't act on it. So once you figure out what that next step is, you got to take action. Yep. I mean, you have to take action. Gosh, it's been a great episode. And I truly think um, what I love about you showing up on this episode is your vulnerability. And to me, that is, that is knowing yourself, knowing and being honest with yourself. I think vulnerability is a superpower. I say this to many people that I truly, I, I was never vulnerable. I held my cards close to my chest for a, a number of years, but being vulnerable, oh, man, it's just a weight off your shoulders Yeah, and, you, and it gives you an opportunity to actually know yourself. Right. Sure. Which is the first step, right? First step. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. Beautiful. How can people learn more about Josh and maybe tell us a little bit about your books um, and your podcast? Yeah, sure. So um, if you need to get a hold of me, the easiest way to do that is the Chase Collective LLC.com. Uh, that's the business that I started. I coach, I do mentoring, I travel, I speak, I write books. Uh, everything is kind of on that website. So if you go to that website, all my books are there. Um, I'm most known. My most known book is Jump Seat Leadership, the guide to informal leadership in the fire service. Um, it was really kind of just my 15 year journey before I got promoted as a fireman sitting in that jump seat and a lot of things that I learned, obviously my perspective, my stories. Um, but I think it could help. I think it helps people in the fire service that maybe they don't want to take that promotional exam or, you know, they're, they're sitting in the back seat and they feel that call to lead, but they don't quite know how to do it. So this book just encourages you to lead wherever you're at in the fire service. I'm a true believer and it does not take rank or a title to lead. In any industry, I think leadership is not, it's not necessarily a title. You know, sometimes it can be a choice depending on where you're serving. So that's the book I'm no, most known for, I would say right now, is Jump Seat Leadership, the guide to informal leadership in the fire service. 
I just released a new book that's super personal, which actually details a lot about what we talked about today and really kind of plans out how you can pursue purpose. I talk about six principles in this book on how to actually fight for your purpose. I tell my story. Uh, you know, I let you know that life is a struggle and it's not going to be easy, but through these six principles, the first one being truth, like I just talked about, you can actually change your life. Um, this book is called engage the enemy fight for your purpose. That's available. Uh, you can get that on the website. I mean, I have social media accounts out there, jump seat leadership, social media, engage the enemy, social media. Um, as much as I do not like social media, you gotta be on it and I'm on it and I'm pretty active. So uh, you can get a hold of me. There may be more than one Josh Chase out there, but there's only one Josh Chase. So <laughs> if you need to get a hold of me, um, now you can find me. And, and honestly, all my books, um, they're all meant to strengthen, empower, and encourage. Like I said, you know, I take a few subtle jabs here and there. I am a fireman at heart. Uh, I know who I am. I know what career I came up in. I don't mind stirring the hornet's nest every now and then, you know, but I also don't mind a good discussion on the back of stirring the hornet's nest. I don't think I'm always right. But I do think my books add perspective um, that they challenge people. And my whole goal at the end of the day, the heart behind everything I do is, like I said, to strengthen, encourage and empower other people and really hope. And it's it's woven in every part of who I am, all my stories. I just hope that when people encounter me and run into me and actually find out what I've been through and who I am, that that they walk away inspired and they walk away wanting to change and you know, it's, I, I don't tell people in my classes what to do. I offer them perspective and then I go home and I always challenge them. I say, I'm leaving after this okay. and I may never run into you again, but you have a choice. You have a choice to change and, and, I, and I'm going to go home and you can get a hold of me on my website and we can talk and, you know, maybe I'll be back, but I may never see you again. And the choices I've made in my life are for me and, and my family. And they've led me to a place where I can spread hope and help other people. And, uh, yeah, so that's how you can get a hold of me. So. Awesome. How about a little plug for your podcast? Yeah, so Firehouse Leadership Podcast. Uh, it's me and uh, Captain Jared Sergi from Trial by Fire. Um, it's been great. I was doing a Jump Seat Leadership Podcast, and I was like, man, this would be really cool to do with a co-host. Had him on as a guest. I've known Jared for, man, geez, since 2005. I've known him since I got in the fire service. I've known mm -hmm. him all 19 years of my career. Huh? So. We ended up at the same station together. We pretty much grew up and learned how to be firemen together. So we share a lot of the same mindsets. We don't agree on everything, which is kind of cool too, because we get into that on the podcast. But it's a cool dynamic. We're two guys that love the fire department. Uh, I'd say we're pretty real. We talk a lot of shop. And he's a captain. I'm a lieutenant. But at the end of the day, you know, like I said, I think we'd both summarize our bios into like my, our names are Jared and Josh and we like going to fires. You know, <laughs> we're, we're firemen that have realized yeah. You know, it does sometimes take somebody that wants to move up and make some changes. And so we've made that decision. You know, we've chosen to climb the ladder and, you know, try and make some changes. But the podcast has been great. Um, you know, we're just we're just finding any avenue we can just to inspire some change, you know, shake it up a little bit. Every now and then we say something that people don't agree with, but we're OK with that. You know, I think that's what that's what produces growth. We can't all agree. Yeah, and yeah. uh no. Yeah, I need I need a different perspective. You need a different perspective. So yeah. podcast is awesome. Obviously, you can catch on all major platforms. And if you follow me on social media, everything I just said, I you know, I'm on I'm pretty active. So you, yeah. you can find it from there too. Awesome. Well, it's been a real honor to sit down with you. I got uh, about two or three pages of little notes that I wanted to uh, ask. So maybe we're uh, destined to do a, a second edition. Oh, let's uh, do it. I'm in. Yeah, because there's a I, I just want to dive into leadership more with you, but I think today's episode and today's topic was so powerful. And I think a, a really a story that people need to hear. So yeah, I, I'm glad that it, it took our, our whole episode to, to cover that. Cause it's important if you, know, we can't be good leaders if we don't have purpose and vision yet. Right. So yeah, that we kind of set the stage for the, the next one. So let's do it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been a real honor, Josh, and uh, all the best to you. Thanks for keep pumping out great content and. Uh, it seems like you have a book out every couple of days. It feels like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. And I can't wait for you to tell your story in the, beneath the helmet, uh, stories of hope, which is going to be released, uh, hopefully this, this fall. So fantastic. Uh, Josh, any final words? No, um, no, that's it. I really appreciate awesome. you having me on. I mean, I don't take these things lightly, so I appreciate you letting me share with the audience. Thank you so oh, much. Likewise. Likewise. All right, everyone, hope you enjoyed this amazing conversation with Josh Chase. Until next time.
Stay well. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.